Hello, everyone. Welcome to the program. This is Politics Today, live on Channels Television. I'm sure Kimale in Abuja. Let's begin tonight by letting you know that the trio of Bukola Saraki, Amin Otambua, the governor of Sokoto, and Governor Mohamed of Bochi have continued their consultations over getting a consensus northern presidential candidate ahead of the People's Democratic Party presidential primary. Today, they were in some states of the south-south region of the country. First, uh, their first port of call was in Delta State, where they met the governor, Ofanyi Okowa. The former president of the Senate, Dr. Bukola Saraki, says that all the presidential aspirants of the People's Democratic Party from the north are working for a consensus candidate of foster desired unity in the country. Saraki disclosed this in Asaba on Monday uh, when he led other aspirants, including Governor Aminu Tambua of Sokoto State, Balaam Mohamed of Bochi, and the former managing director of FSB International Bank, KOC, Elijah Mohamed Ayatuddin, on a consultative visit to Governor Ifan Yokoa at the government house in Asaba. Governor Okowa says consensus candidacy is indeed in the best interest of the unity of the party and the country. Take a listen to the Governor of Delta State. This action that few have taken uh, today to cause this visitation in the south and having also visited some of our brothers in the north is actually a step in the right direction. It is strengthening us, it will tend to pull us together, and it is a prayer that God will help you to be able to achieve uh, uh, this consensus that we seek to build. Because in that consensus, we'll be united as a party. It will give strength to us. Uh, it, it will also give a lot of hope and encouragement to Nigerians. As soon as they finished in Delta State, they moved swiftly to the neighboring Edo State, where they met the governor, Godwin Obaseki, the government house in Benin City, the Edo State capital. Mr. Obaseki says he's on the same page with the PDP presidential hopefuls. And uh, the presidential officials are now bent on getting the buying of uh, as many leaders of the PDP as they can Ghana. Take a listen to Bukola Saraki after their meeting with Governor Godwin Obaseki of Edo State. Consensus is that all, if all the aspirants, we can have one aspirant, honestly, for all of us, it doesn't matter where it comes from. The issue today in Nigeria goes beyond. The things that we're talking about. Nigerians are going through a difficult time. This, this, I keep on saying that, and I don't want to, to panic anybody. We're inching towards a failing state unless we get our act together. The place is not safe, the cost of living, we must not shut anybody out. What we need now is the best hands to be able to turn this country around. Tonight, our attention is on security. Perhaps some of these issues we discussed over the weekend in the situation in Kaduna State, the train attack, and some of the other pockets of attacks that we have seen over the last few days. For some moment, you wonder, it does look like things seem at in terms of the, the attacks and some of the activities of these bandits and terrorists. But what has happened in the last few days? We dig deeper into the budget of the defense and security apparatus of the country, how much is being spent, what is happening, can we afford mercenaries, is mercenary, iron of mercenaries, the right way to go? This is some of the perspective that we'll bring into the conversation tonight. So with me, everyone. But before we get into that, I'd like to give you an update of some of your political stories and our political roundup. A coalition of northern youth tagged the Unified North Nigeria Youth Forum has advocated for power shift to the southern part of the country after President Mohamed Buhari has served out his tenure. The youth group stated this in Sokoto when they visited the state for the continuation of consultation and called on the governor of the Nigeria Central Bank, Godwin Amefile, to contest for office of president come 2023. 
The group say in the spirit of equity, justice, peace, tranquility and brotherhood, a Nigerian from the southern part of the country should take over the mantle of leadership from President Mohamed Buhari in 2023. They call on all political parties in the country to zone their presidential candidate to the southern part of the country in the 2023 general election. They describe the CBN governor, Godwin Emefile, as the right choice to replace President Buhari in 2023 owing to his track record, competence, integrity and wealth of experience in managing the economy. Uh, and inshallah. The Adama State Governor Omar Fintiri had expressed confidence that former Vice President Atiku Abubakar will clinch the presidential ticket of the PDP for the 2023 general elections. The governor made this known while speaking to journalists shortly after arriving in Yola after an official trip to Abuja. According to him, the former Vice President Atiku Abubakar has the experience, knowledge and understands the dynamics of the constituent parts of Nigeria and is adequately prepared to salvage it from its current state. We have started the scheming, we have started working, we are conversing the support and very soon you see him emerging as the flag bearer of the PDP. On why he was the only sitting Nigerian governor at Atiku's presidential declaration, Governor Fintiri says politics is always local, therefore home support is crucial. And that is why they are provided for former Vice President Atiku Abubakar. And they have already started consultations, contacts and planning. And very soon, al Haj Atiku Abubakar will emerge as a presidential flag bearer of the PDP. That's according to him. Nigeria's former Senate President Dr. Bukola Sarke insists that the consensus candidate will be in the best interest of the People's Democratic Party, which according to him is the party that can rescue Nigeria, which is tethering on the brink of collapse due to the current economic and insecurity challenges. Dr. Sarke adds that the incoming president of Nigeria would have enough to contend with in fixing the problems, and this task should be easier if the candidate is the unanimous decision of party members. We also have some of the aspirants too, also who are still from the Thinking about it can also look at this consensus arrangement too. So that at the end of the day, the PDP will be united and will provide leadership to this country. Ahead of the 2023 general election, the National Rescue Movement, NRM, recently held its national convention in Abuja to elect national officers and chart the way forward for the party. Those elected include the National Chairman, Ambassador Isaac Chiguze Ude, National Secretary, Mohamed Dambuba Guzo, Addressing delegates of the convention, National Chairman Ketika Committee, Sovea Abubakar Usman Jikamshi, said the party is committed to rescue the nation from poor leadership. And he said the party is the alternative that Nigerians are searching for. Jikamshi then expresses confidence in the independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, to conduct free, fair and credible elections come 2023. The PDP party secretary today welcomed the number two man in Abia executive, Saude Okochuku, as he declared his interest to run for the governorship position of the state. Recall that the ruling party in the state had earlier zoned the seats to two different senatorial districts, Abia North and Abia Central, making a mess of the PDP standing zoning system in the state. While declaring his intention, Udeo Kochuku said he joined the race to secure as well as build Abia and call on all and sundry to join hands together to take the state to its enviable height. Thank you so much, everyone. Let's get to the table of uh, this conversation tonight. And it's about security. So it's very important, isn't it? And perhaps one of the biggest rules of government. There have been palpable fear and apprehension across the country over the past days as the attacks and some insecurity incidents are now on the rise. From train attack by bandits and the abduction of yet to be a certain number of people to the invasion of an estate in Zaria, uh, around Zaria, and kidnap of another senior staff of the Customs Service, the situation has come to a head and gotten many people worried as to the capacity of our security institutions in the country in ensuring safety of citizens and the nation. A former president, Ulusha Kumabasanya, has aired his views on this matter. Take a listen to what President uh, Olusha Gombasun just said. The situation we are in the country today is not a situation where one man will say, yes, I have the solution. Unless we are deceiving ourselves. And I believe that we need to sit down collectively, look at the situation. A situation where the train, you are not safe on the road. 
you are not safe in the train. You are not safe uh, at the airport. Then what remains? And that is a very, very serious situation. I believe that all right thinking Nigerians must know that we have a situation that is has overwhelmed the present administration. But we should not allow that uh, situation to overwhelm Nigeria. That is a concern, and the words of uh, from uh, the former president Olusha Kambasanjo. As many Nigerians continue to wonder what could be the solution of the da I mean, to these dastardly acts and the incessant killings by these uh, very disturbing elements, the governor of Kaduna State, Nasir Erufai, has been quoted to have said there is a need to hire mercenaries to fight these terrorist elements. Governor Erufai is quoted to have said, quote, I have complained to Mr. President, and I swear to God, if action is not taken, we as governors will take actions to protect the lives of our people. If it means deploying foreign mercenaries to come and do the work, we will do it to address these challenges. Meanwhile, a northern social political organization, the Arawa Consultative Forum, has cautioned on that school of thought that is hiring of a mercenary. Take a listen to what the Arawa Consultative Forum had to say on this matter. So, the Arawa Consultative Forum are of the opinion that we cannot go and hire mercenaries. We've done that in the past. And what are the consequences or the implications of getting mercenaries or foreigners to fight our wars for us? Well, that's a school of thought. So you wonder what exactly is a way out of this mess, this incessant killings of uh, innocent Nigerians and the wanton destruction that we see in our land. Since the assumption of office of this administration in 2015, the Buhari administration promised to end the insecurity in the land, especially in the northeast region, where Boko Haram at the time were ravaging that region. Insurgents have made their trade a customized institution. The government said it will not spare anything in ensuring safety of Nigerians. Insecurity has since spread to other parts of the country. Other than the northeast, Activities of bandits in the northwest and parts of the north central region have intensified. The southeast is grappling with unknown gunmen and those who are killing and kidnapping people. And kidnapping has now been, uh, rage, uh, been uh, raging across the country, particularly mass abduction in schools and communities. Zamfara Kaduna said, have a bad taste of this kind of situation. Well, with this, the Buhari government has jacked up its expenditures for security and has spent almost 12 trillion naira in just about seven years on security. Most of these uh, years, these budgets are more than that of education and health put together. But the nation still experiences a spread of attacks on innocent killings. Take a look at the history of budgets since 2015 for security in Nigeria. And you see the progression. From 2015, it was less than a trillion. Uh, 2015, it went to a trillion in 2016. But what will you see as of 2022? It's now 2.4 trillion naira. That is how much Nigeria is spending on security is about 15 percent or more of our annual budget in the nation now let's get talking everyone shall we i have to dissect these issues for us a former military officer group captain sadiq show here with me in our buja studio thanks so much for coming thank you show and a security scholar, someone who has written widely on the issues of insecurity in the northeast region of the country, especially the activities of Boko Haram. He's a fellow at uh, the Tony Blair Institute in London. Mr. Bulama Bukati joins us from London. Thank you so much, Mr. Bukati, for joining us tonight on the program. Let's get started. Thank you, you And perhaps let me get your view, uh, Mr. Bukati, if you can hear me. Um, what do you suppose 
is the problem. We thought that things were simmering and perhaps the activities of these bandits are on the low. All of a sudden, in one week, we saw mass abduction of people on a train, um, the, the attack on a train, and also abduction we saw in some other parts of Kaduna State. The question a lot of people will also be asking, why Kaduna State? Can you give an answer or can you figure out what could have been the cause of recent attacks that we've seen? I mean, cause of recent attacks, uh, Sheun, is not anything different from the causes of the attacks we know uh, previously. And you are right that we saw uh, the situation getting a lull or uh, becoming a bit calmer in the past few weeks or months, but then we saw these big attacks now. But this is not isolation and it is not a surprise, neither is the train attack a surprise. They, made, uh, they experimented a few months ago with the trend attack that did not succeed. And then we saw another military precision attack that now uh, happened. Uh, as to why, I mean, it is happening at this time, uh, like I said, I mean, it, it is typical of the Nigerian security architecture. It is not that you have activity every day, every day uh, 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 in the same scale. It is that you would have a big attack one day. Uh, all of us, the politicians, journalists, analysts, and everyone gets talking. And then after a week, we forget. They go and, uh, I mean, organize or orchestrate another attack and then, uh, I mean, roll it out. And that's what they have been doing, unfortunately, uh, over the years. But when you ask about the problem, for me, the major problem of insecurity is not manpower. It's not lack of equipment, even though these are problems. The major problem for me is lack of leadership. It's lack of policy, lack of strategy at the federal level. And that's why you see each governor doing as they want. That's why security forces and intelligence agencies are not working together. You and I know, all Nigerians know that the military does not work with the Nigeria police force. In fact, the average Nigerian soldier sees the Nigerian police officer as a rival, and the police officer sees the military as a rival. The DSS have been saying publicly for two years now that they have been gathering intelligence, and they have been sending those intel to the right people, but their intel are not being acted upon. Nigeria has 17 security and law enforcement agencies but there is no single person coordinating. There is no single policy bringing them together. Like you said, this situation has been deteriorating for seven years in the Northwest. But until today, the federal government does not have a policy framework, a security policy framework on the Northwest. And so we are, I mean, it is just like tra uh, traveling without a map without anything to guide you in your travel and uh, expecting that you would succeed. It won't happen uh, that way. Things don't happen that way, especially security uh, situations. You have, uh, before I come to Group Captain Sadiq, who is at experience on the ground, as a scholar, Mr. Bukati, the activities, you have, have someone who has written so much and studied the activities of Boko Haram over the years. With what we're seeing in the activities of these bandits that have been tagged terrorists now, they're abducting, very similar to what Boko Haram also will do. They're killing and maiming. They're invading communities, local communities, and also using locals for intelligence purposes. It does look like there is a similarity in the activities with that of Boko Haram. What can you tell us about these bandits? Are they Boko Haram in some sense, or what is it that we do not know? Yeah, so uh, you are right, but unfortunately, some of these attacks by the so-called bandits are worse than Boko Haram attacks. So, for example, when we talk about school abductions, Boko Haram's biggest school abduction was the, was the abduction of the Chibok girls, 276 of them in April of 2014. Last year alone, bandits have abducted over 1,000 school children in eight different attacks. And in, in each of these, there are credible reports showing that money was paid to free those children. And when money is paid, we know that they are going to use this money to get more arms, to get sophisticated, to get more supplies, and that's exactly what they are doing. According to the bandits, in one operation in Kaduna State, they were paid over 200 million naira. 200 million naira in one operation in the uh, Catholic school that was, uh, uh, that was attacked in Kaduna last year. And so 
you have a mass school abduction. Boko Haram has never uh, been able to attack a train, although they would have uh, wanted to. But bandits have been able to do that. Now, bandits that are able to attack a moving train with the kind of military precision that they did uh, last week, what will stop them from attacking uh, markets? What will stop them from attacking churches if they wanted? What will stop them from attacking mosques if they wanted? What will stop them from attacking schools? Now, but it is not only that. What will even stop them from Scotland Nigeria's 2023 elections and throw the whole country in confusion and chaos and disarray? Now, of course, we know that... Apologies to cut in, uh, Mr. Bukati. Would you say that these elements that were called bandits are perhaps more sophisticated than Boko Haram? Or more organized, I would say they are more sophisticated, but they are getting increasingly sophisticated. And this is something we have warned, Shewun. I have written two years ago, I have spoken two years ago that Boko Haram is infiltrating them and that Boko Haram is able to teach them uh, manufacturing of explosives, something bandits do not know how to do. And that if Boko Haram gives them that technology, then we are going to see carnage and chaos in the northwestern part of Nigeria. I had to be right in these issues, but unfortunately, this is what is unfolding in the Northwest. But if we don't act decisively now, this trend attack would, would only be the beginning of a new chapter in the bandits' carnage in Nigeria. And so uh, I, we know that Boko, right. they are learning from Boko Haram, but we also know that Boko Haram is active in the Northwestern part of Nigeria and in the North Central. No group has claimed responsibility now. Uh, Governor El Rifai, claims that it is Boko Haram that it was Boko Haram that planned and launched the attack. We don't know for sure, but we can't rule out that possibility. Boko Haram has been active in Kaduna, in Niger, in Zamfara, and other places of the Northwest and the North, uh, and North Central. Unfortunately, governments were too slow to acknowledge that fact. And no, but let's get it clearly. This is perhaps the first time we'll be hearing such a, a, and it is news to my ears, that Boko Haram have been playing an active role in some part of the Northwest region. We thought that they were reduced and uh, uh, pushed to the Northeast region. Are you saying that Boko Haram have infiltrated this part of the Northwestern and North Central region of the country? Definitely, definitely, definitely they have infiltrated. Uh, number one, we know that Ansaru, the fa a faction of Boko Haram that has been inactive uh, until January last year, has been in the Northwest for eight, I mean, for 10 years now, since 2012 when they were formed, they were pursued by Shekau, who saw them as rebels, and therefore they defected to the Northwestern part of Nigeria, and they lived mostly in Zamfara State. We know that for sure, but they were inactive from 2013 when they launched attacks uh, in the, uh, and I can give you a list of attacks they perpetrated. But it is not only them now, uh, the ISIS affiliate, Islamic State West Africa province, in November of 2019, claimed an attack in Sokoto on a police station in Sokoto. And they said they orchestrated that attack from Niger and launched the attack in Nigeria. It is not only that. It, I mean, the Ansaru faction has been acknowledged by the Nigerian military itself. It has been uh, putting out information saying they have killed so so number of Ansaru fighters in Kaduna or in Niger. And Ansaru is a faction of Boko Haram. There are three factions, the Shekau faction, faction which is called Jazz, the Islamic State West Africa province, and Ansaru. And so they are definitely active, uh, two factions of Boko Haram, but even the Shekau faction has been putting out videos since January last year of places that right. look like Mr. Niger Bukati. State, and they yeah. have been claiming that they are active in Niger State. All right, quickly, because I would love to come to the Abuja studio here based on some of the insight that they have provided tonight and get uh, the thoughts and the expertise of Group Captain Sadiq Show. But just in a few seconds, if you can tell me, you've uh, highlighted and made mention of lack of coordination between or amongst the security agencies. So what then is the role of the, uh, the National Security Advisor, the Office of the NSA, has been coordinated by the NSA himself uh, at the moment, Babangana Mungunun. The NSA office, we thought that he coordinates uh, all the security agencies. I mean, the, the NSA is a political appointee, and you know the military, and even the police will not listen to a political appointee. And if you have listened to the NSA's uh, interview on BBC Hausa last year, 
in which he complained that billions voted for security hardware have gone missing under this administration. You know that he is frustrated. You know that he isn't being listened to. And when you look at what the military is doing and what different said governments are doing, today we are talking about Kaduna. The governor of Kaduna is in panic mood. But two months, three months ago, it was the governor of Niger. But today, the governor of Niger is silent because he thinks Kaduna's problem is not his problem. The governor of Zamfara is quiet. The governor of Sokoto is quiet because they are not united. They are not coordinated. When one governor is in panic, uh, the, the rest keep quiet. And then the next next, uh, next time, their own state will be running right. and they will be quiet while other governors yeah. are quiet. Let me come to our Abuja studio here with uh, Group Captain Sadiq Shew. Uh, you heard some of those. He's a scholar. Mm -hmm. He writes so much. He researches about these issues. Can you comment on some of those things that he has said? Perhaps give us an insight on why Kaduna State. We've seen so much of the activities of these uh, terrorist elements in that state. Well, thank you very much, uh, Shew. Now, straight off, uh, uh, Mr. Bukarchi, I have what he said. I start from the issues he raised about uh, the problem of Nigerian security. It's not numbers, it's not equipment. With due respect, I will, uh, I will slightly disagree with him. There is a problem of numbers when you're taking over the military. Uh, a research has been done. You know, there is no specific formula which says a country of such size or such population should have such number. But what you do is international comparison. An international comparison of countries with similar population, with similar area, with similar GDP, even among our neighboring countries of Niger, uh, Cameroon, Chad, you will find that Nigeria is underserviced as far as the size of our armed forces is. We are a country of 160 up to 200, depending on uh, source, million people. And then our total strength of the armed forces is not up to 150,000. All ranks, that is the uh, Army, Air Force, and Navy. So certainly, and uh, we are a country, or like other countries, even neighboring countries that have a reserve force, an official reserve force, we do not have a reserve. So this conflict caught us with inadequate numbers. There is no doubt about that, that the numbers we have compared to our size of country, the size of problem we're having is not enough. There is also the problem of equipment. I have seen the budget, and uh, to be fair to this government, in terms of budgetary allocation, in terms of purchases, it has done maybe better than many other regions in the past. Uh, maybe we should put that figure, I mean, that uh, table again yes, up, yes. so that people can see uh, the table on the issue of the budget since 2015 on, on security in Nigeria. All right, there yes. it goes. So you can see the, you know, the, the, the incremental uh, over, uh, you know, leap and frogs of uh, what we spend on security. However, as a security analyst, I would also caution on using just mere numbers. Because in security and defense, what matters most sometimes is not how much you spend, but how well you spend it. It's possible to pour all this money into it if you don't follow the money. If uh, projects or equipment that are actually needed by the fighting forces are not decent, you may spend this money, you will not get decent. And I want to advise the federal government to really look at what is this money being used for. Uh, we have to talk frankly because our country is challenged. When you have a country that is basically at war with bandits, with insurgents, you would think that security budget should be channeled towards increasing operational capacity. Unfortunately, it is at this time that we find the National Assembly and the executive branch of the armed forces opening universities, building bigger you know, barracks which are not wanted. So these are some of the issues that we have to look at. This is what I mean by it is not actually what you spend. All right. It is how well you spend it. All so right. there are issues on like what uh, uh, Dr. Bukarchi said. I think there are still an issue of numbers and equipment we are not adequate. All right, just the a equipment, let, me, let me finish, please. No, okay. and, uh, and, and in the final analysis, he talked about leadership. Now, I can only look at leadership in terms of lack of oversight. When you, you don't when, think there's a problem of coordination? There is that. It can still be subsumed under the leadership. What I'm saying is that you know, the, it, it, we're in a democracy. Unfortunately, what I see happening, because of our history of military regime, there is tendency for the civilians in the uh, executive branch and the uh, legislative branch to do a hands-off. I was on an interview on BBC two days ago with a, with, a, with a national legislator. 
he claims, and I'm not saying claim he brought, he brought figures, that throughout his time from 2018 to now, they have been releasing money 100%, because there's all of this allegation that sometimes what is budgeted is not what was released. released. But uh, to be fair to him, he was honest enough when he was asked, are you sure the money was being used? His answer was that uh, he's not part of a uh, military administration, he doesn't know anything. So you see a problem. All right. If you are giving so people money... Let's do it for a break. Yes, and I'd like, like to come back when, uh, when, uh, when, when we come back from the break. We've since been joined by Professor Usman Yusuf, uh, former Executive Secretary of the NHIS, who is going to also be giving us his views on some of these uh, national issues. We take a break, everyone. And when we come back, my panel tonight, Professor Yusuf, Mr. Bukati in London, and Group Captain Sadiq Shea will be giving expert opinions and their views and experience on some of these national security dilemma that our nation faces today. What is a way out? So much, everyone, for staying with us right here on the program. Security gets our attention, and perhaps the spate of these attacks and killings get us talking tonight on the program. But before I get back to my guest tonight on the program, let's take a look at one of the activities of uh, those who are jostling for the number one office in the land. There's been some consultations being made, and one of the presidential hopefuls, the governor of River State, in some week, was in Lagos to seek solidarity with leaders of his party, the People's Democratic Party. He was also seen to have uh, visited the former head of state, uh, General Ibrahim Badamosi Babangida. Take a listen to uh, one of the delegates at the meeting with uh, the former head of state, IBB. I have come with my colleagues, the governor of Rivers, governor of Enugu, governor of Oyo, uh, some members of the National Assembly, and uh, other stakeholders. First, to um, consult with um, um, the former head of state and discuss national issues, economic development, security, unity of our country, and also to commend him for his uh, support for the unity of this country. And um, the discussions went very well, and uh, we will advance it from there. He expects the younger generation to take up the gauntlet and um, rescue Nigeria. So the consultation does not have to do with the 2023 presidency? No, we'll discuss that later. That's the governor of Abia said, okay, is uh, when they visited uh, from our head of state, Ibrahim Abraham Munsi, in Niger State. Let's continue with our conversation. My panel tonight, Professor Usman Yusuf, a former executive secretary of the NHIS and a member of the Northern Elders Forum, and as well as group captain Sadiq Shewu, a retired military officer, and in London is a security researcher and expert, Mr. Bulama Bukati. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for coming on tonight. Before I come to Prof, um, group captain, give us a sense of um, when, I mean, I was asking the question about Kaduna State. Why Kaduna State? Why are we seeing much of these activities happening in Kaduna State? Is there any reason in particular? Well, um, maybe we look at uh, historical reasons. If you are taking up the north, Kaduna historically has been the center of northern Nigeria. Uh, apart from that, even in current discourse, like people have been quickly able to point also even making more, 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 what can I say, more, more celebrity status to the attackers. Kaduna is probably the most garrison town in the whole of Nigeria. If you look at the security, you know, uh, uh, installations, agencies, training schools. How many nation. do we have there? I do not know. We, but we have be, the, the, the you defense have the academy. Defense academy. You have the Armed Forces Command and Staff College. You have the Defense Industries Corporation. Nearby, you have uh, the Kachia Artillery Artillery School. You have the Air Force Base. You have the one D headquarters. You Shouldn't have the those school. be a deterrent to this? Exactly. Attacks? So sometimes uh, that's why I see this particular attack on Kaduna as a sort of not only as a sort of a prestige. A prestige attack on the on the side of the attackers because the point they are making if you can hit Kaduna with all this array, remember including the attack in NDA itself and carrying one officer and killing one other. So I think uh, more than uh, in those particular attacks, more than money, 
or reward or, 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 or as a, I, I mean, uh, to collect ransom, I think it was more as a prestige attack to say this. And uh, unfortunately, the point has been made is that we can raise above your security architecture, we can hit you anywhere. Hmm. Unfortunately, they have made that point. All right, now, let's, uh, uh, Prof, let me get your view on what is happening in Cardinal. I mean, I, I asked the question earlier from Mr. Bugatti, and we thought that things were simmering. All of a sudden, we've seen a rise. What could have been the cause? All right, good. Uh, Sharon, thank you for having me. Tell the world how you got me here. Siren Blair in Yes, North. absolutely. It was, it was a tough one getting you. <laughs> Good. Truly. Thank you very much. But seriously, Nigerians, we need to take a deep breath. We are in a very serious situation. The security situation in this country has gotten out of hand. I'm a practical man. I'm a doctor. And Shagumi, we are doctors. We dropped this. Instead of sitting in the office and hearing it, we went to the lion's dance. We visited eight states, deep in the forest, five in the front line, northwest state, and three in the north central state. I met all of these war commanders. Why did we go? The reason we went was to listen. Martin Luther King said, violence is the language of the unheard. We are here talking to ourselves. We have a whole set of people that we are not talking to that they are carrying arms against us. And we are here editorializing and saying, we don't know them. They don't know us. You don't know your enemy, the enemy you're fighting, you're just fighting in the dark. And that's exactly what we're doing. We went to listen. What we had all over, all the problems are local, solutions, must be found locally. In none of these eight states we went to, did we hear any of the bandits tell us they have a problem, a gripe against the Nigerian military or against the federal government. The biggest problems are always local. We need to understand it. And now this is the danger. In the last week, we've had sleepless nights. I'm very sad. What, we've been, what we have been scared would happen has happened. That is the nexus and the, 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 the unholy alliance between bandits and Iswap. Is the that moment, happening? Absolutely. The moment we saw that, 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 that tra train attack, we knew this was not the job of the ragtag bandits we, we, we saw. Visited. This is the modus operandi of Iswap. Maiduguri, the capital city of Borno, has not had electricity now for 14, 15 months because Boko Haram Iswab, they blew the transmission light into Maiduguri twice. They are after infrastructure. These guys are not after that. They went to the airport, and now they're blowing up major infrastructure on the highway. They are literally blockading, blockading the city of Kaduna. You cannot go safely by road, by rail, or by air. So what is it? They are literally picking infrastructure. Why are they interested in Kaduna? Do Good. you know? No, okay. And this is, when we came back, I am, we've had experiences in my life that we've never had. We dropped everything and went, like we went back to school. We went back to school. We listened to them. We listened to their major mortal enemies, the Ensakais. We listen to Amias, we listen to their arrows, we come back, we listen to the governors, and we reach out to the hierarchy of the military, and we reach out to the hierarchy of the police and the DSS. This thing cannot be won by any one party. What is the grievance? Okay. This the, the grievances have now morphed into criminality. There are legal Fulani herders that have lived their journey. I'm Fulani. My folks are herders in the forest that have generational grievances that now these bandits have taken, just like anywhere you have criminals that will take somebody else's grievance for their criminality. We need to tease out the difference between legal Fulanis, like my folks in the forest, and these bandits that are not representing them, that are criminals that are using their, their, their grievances as their reasons for doing what they're doing. When we go to the forest, we sit down on the carpet and they surround us. And Sheikh Gumi hears, listens to all of them. 
and he's the first person that stands up and speaks to them in the sternness of voices. We've had your grievances. Your grievances are real, they are genuine, but there are no reason. There are no reason for what you are doing. This is not us. This is not our upbringing. This is not our culture. This is not anywhere in our scripture. Just the way we come to you, we go back to our leaders, our governors, and hear and tell them everything. But whatever you're doing, your grievances are no reason for what you're doing. Killing, raping, maiming, and burning cities. Nobody, no scripture, no culture, no cleric will accept what you're doing. He says that in the sternest of voices. We need to continue having engagements. And I saw that clearly. They listened to clerics. Turuji, we saw Turuji, we saw Dogogi, we saw Kachala Ali. They said they would not have gathered if it wasn't for a cleric. They did not necessarily know uh, Shegumi. If it was a politician or anybody, they, they would. There is a loss of confidence, loss of faith in the political process and our politicians because they are disconnected from the realities of our people. We need to get people that can talk to these people, that they will listen. Will it take one engagement, two engagements, three engagements? No, it will take concerted effort of everybody. Since it's taking a criminal dimension, right. how do we, I mean, can we turn, turn the hands of time? Right, okay. So now the danger and the fear we are fearing is coming, that this marriage between ISWAP and, 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 bandits. and bandits is going to be the most lethal, the most lethal combination this country has ever seen. And it will be an existential threat to the survival of this nation if we do not face it completely. And there is nowhere in the history of warfare that these conflicts have been won on the battlefield. None. None. Any real military person will tell you the purpose of the military is to enable, is to bring an enabling environment for dialogue to happen. But this thing cannot be won militarily. Hmm. And the reason, people need to understand and ask the question, why hasn't Boko Haram and Iswa penetrated the Northwest and the North Central? The Northwest particularly over the last 13 years. It wasn't by accident or it wasn't for lack of trying. They tried severally in Kano, tried to bomb the Emir of Kano. But the main reason was the proactive and intense behind the scene hard work of clerics and traditional rulers in these zones that preach to their, to, to their followers not to follow this, 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 uh, this twisted ideology that this Boko Haram are coming. They were going around the Northwest and the North Central long before they picked up arms. But the clerics and the traditional rulers of, the, of these regions preach, preach seriously to their followers, not to accept this. Now they have gotten a foothold where they've been trying to get a foothold for the last 13 years. Mm. We need to go back to where we were. Traditional rulers and clerics need to be engaged to come into this. The military will never win this. The politicians now, will never win this. So we're talking about solutions now. And let, let me bring in these aspects of the, the, I mean, it does look like some leaders are frustrated about this situation. And I could read frustration in the words of the governor of uh, Kaduna State. And I'd like Mr. Bukati to come back into the conversation. Let me read again what Governor Nasu Arifai said. He said, and I quote again, I have complained to Mr. President, and I swear to God, if action is not taken, we as governors, we take actions to protect the lives of our people. If it means deploying foreign mercenaries to come and do the work we will do it to address these challenges mr bukati these are the words that we quoted for i mean the governor of cardinal state has said what's your view on using mercenaries can we go that route i mean first uh showing uh Erufai's statement uh, or outburst is echoing the prostration of many nigerians many nigerians have seen how Nigeria is failing them and how they are suffering in human lives and in their property. And this is not a sustainable thing. We cannot continue in this way. But when it comes to the question of mercenaries, the first thing is that, is that no governor, uh, Erufai suggested that Northwestern governor will employ mercenaries. Our constitution is very clear that they cannot do that. That's unconstitutional. They do not have the power under our laws even to arm their own citizens to fight, because under the Firearms Act, governors do not have the power to issue license to carry weapons, especially military-grade weapons, which is needed in this fight. But number three, Erufai himself knows that. 
He knows that he doesn't have the constitutional power. But then who would have thought a politician will play to the gallery and do political posturing in an election year? Because that's what's going on, unfortunately. And this is not an issue we should be politicizing. A revised statement, uh, even uh, Minister Amechi's statement, clearly show that those in government, those in the ruling party, have now been recognized or understood or are ready now to admit that the government solution is not uh, going the way, I mean, to plan, and that the government is not winning the war against uh, these people. When it comes to the question of numbers, which is something I raised in the beginning, of course, I said numbers do matter, and it is a problem, but that's not the biggest problem. And group captain gave an estimate of 150 forces. Of course, the, ex the estimate I have is 250,000 um, forces uh, in the Nigerian armed forces. And you won't look at it from the Nigeria's uh, own number because there are countries that do not even have a standing military. What you need to measure that against is the number of the criminal and terrorists and the insurgents we are talking about. All the estimates show that there are less than 50,000. Why is a conventional military with the backing of the state, with all the equipment that they have, including the jets and all the equipment they have, and the, the knowledge and the intelligence gathering uh, capacity that they have, why are they failing to defeat a military of less than 50,000? That's the question we should be asking ourselves. I completely so agree let me Let me bring uh, uh, Group uh, Captain Sadiq on to the solution yeah, matter. I'm... Mercenary. I did, uh, that, that. This is not the first time this country is uh, going in that direction. Can we employ that again? Well, um, when discussing about issues of mercenaries, I would like to call them private uh, military contractors because these are the two words. When you say mercenaries, sometimes it kills the debate because the word itself, mercenaries, right from uh, African wars of independence in Southern Africa, it acquired a negative connotation. So when you use mercenaries, you're already killing the debate because I've given it a negative system. As to issue whether they are used, even countries that are more resourced than Nigeria, they use uh, private military contracts for various reasons. America, for example, uh, prides itself as the uh, global policeman. Sometimes if there is a war in which the United States is interested, but it is not strategic enough to put in American lives in the line, they do use uh, these uh, private military contractors. Now, again, when you say private military contractors, they, they give both uh, 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 you know, uh, war fighting capabilities and other support capabilities. You could decide what you want to do. The truth is that as of now, the way our military is equipped, numbers and equipment vis-a-vis -vis the challenge they are facing, they really need assistance. Whether we should use uh, these PMCs is a debate that we should not close. However, again, I'm with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with Bukarti on the Nigerian laws because defense is on that exclusive list. There is no way a governor of any state, you know, can go on his own to engage mercenaries. But if it is a, it is a, you know, it is a, it is a debate that we have to look at, not to close the door. Do we think our military and security agencies can finish this within a reasonably short time? If the answer is yes, then we can continue trudging on. If, on the other hand, we believe our forces may win, but it's going to take a longer time. You talked about uh, the defense, I mean the money put in defense more than uh, education and, uh, and health combined. There is always this guns and butter debate. When you look at what you are going to pay the mercenaries over the years, what you have done on the graph that you showed, and what, the, what it will take these PMCs to help us, it may not be the whole operation they will take over in any case. People make this mistake. When you hire a, a PMC, like I say, it's hiring your boyfriend, I mean your, your, your husband. You could tell your husband, don't enter into my bedroom. Don't enter into my kitchen. You get the point? But can it work? It will. It will. It depends because but we are why? not a failed state. I mean, we are, you say what? We are not a failed state. Okay. Because people bring issues of uh, in Sierra Leone, they, plotted, they, they, they plundered uh, uh, gold mines, uh, diamonds, and the rest. It could happen where there's a failing government. I do not want to accept that Nigeria is a failed government. When they were brought in 2014, they worked under the supervision of the, of the Nigerian armed forces. It's not as if they were, you know, gallivanting all over the place. The military tells them where to go. So, but the did military you, did tells you, them to the operate. Did you read frustration in the words of Governor Arifat? It's frustration. Because he and said I, if it's not taking, yes. it's for, call it in the northwest, we ensure that they employ mercenary. He must have been talking from a deep sense of frustration, isn't it? It is frustration. That's why we can, we can forgive him for that frustration. But uh, 
uh, you know, uh, uh, constitutionally, it's not a doable thing. All right. And in all over the world, sub, uh, sub national structures like states and local governments cannot go on their own and invite. That is a sovereign responsibility of the federal government. Prof, yeah. weigh in on this one. On mercenaries. Oh, on is that a way? I mean, you were talking about solution. And yeah. some of the things that Governor Arufai said. He said yeah. that if um, the, um, the federal government is not taking action himself and uh, his fellow governors in the Northwest will go for foreign, deploy foreign mercenaries to come and do the work. Yeah. Is that the right way to go? Look, I mean, I, and that's El Rufai doing what he does best. What does he do best? Talk and grandstand. This is political grandstanding, end of story. In an election you year. You don't think it's his own no, way let me of finish. suggesting yeah. solution? Let me finish. There's a political grandstanding in an election year. He knows. He does not have that power to do that. He knows that 11th of March 2021, the, all security heads and the NSC met with the president. And the NSC came and briefed the nation about the result that no foreign mercenaries, clearly. And Governor Erufai has had security issues in his state that he never does anything about. You think he, I mean, is that I mean, fair to say he never does yes, anything? Yes, I've, I've, I, have, I have taken him on by writing on, 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 on newspapers. They have abducted school children, never said anything. We lost five of them. So he and Honorable Minister Amechi are doing nothing but grandstanding. They are too clever by half. They are looking for an off-ramp to jump off this ship that they are part of. They are part of this government that has failed to secure the nation and protect its people. Now they are looking to, to blame somebody else. Oh, is the military, is that? Who in the world thinks in an election year any mercenaries thing will happen? in an election year, when they are looking, they're disconnected from our realities, they want, they're scrambling for offices. Oh, this one say, oh, if you do not bring mercenaries, I'll do that. He does not have that power. They cannot even meet, all the northern governors could not even meet to do the basic simple things together as northern governors to protect our people. We went to Niger State. All the chemists there, close to the forest, are selling drugs. They are selling trauma, Pentax, uh, Bosca, and everything. Governors cannot even meet to do the simple things that fuel this banditry. And the governor is coming and grandstanding and say, let's go bomb the forest, let's get my mercenary. States are poor, so poor that after paying salary, there is not much left. Where are you going to get money to, to, to get, uh, get mercenaries? Go back. If they, all the state governors now, and the president said it when he had an interview uh, with, with Arise. When the state governors come to meet him now with security, he tells them go back and deal with local security architecture. What is the local security architecture in the north and all over the country are the traditional rulers and the clerics. Mm. Right. You as a governor, you don't deal with them. You're saying, oh, we'll bring this, we'll bring this. Is nothing but political grandstanding. And the chairman of the APC said as much when he was asked about the comments of these two gentlemen, Governor Arufai and Amechi, he said, do not use a knife to rip open your belly. As he knows his political grandstanding. They are in this mess together as a government, and they must take full responsibility for not able to secure this country and protect our people. None of them All is right. going to take an off-ramp and distance himself from this failure. Let's close the program now. Uh, allow Mr. Bukati, just in about 20 seconds, to give his final thoughts on this. Yeah, sure. Uh, I was going to say I completely agree with Professor that uh, what you need a developmental approach and as well as the military approach. But I want to emphasize that at this moment in time, what you need more than anything else is the military approach. You cannot go to the bush and be talking to people under the tree who are killing people and massacring women and children, setting them ablaze in buses, uh, abducting children from their school for nothing. If, if these criminals have grievances, the people they are attacking in the train, in schools, setting women ablaze in buses, those women did not do anything to them. And therefore, talking to them for amnesty should not be a trade-off for the military force that is needed. And the government, President Buhari, has to show leadership. He must get his act together, 
bring the governors together, bring security forces together, and I mean, confront this. We're totally out of time, Mr. Bukati, and we need to go now. But I must sincerely thank my very experienced and uh, uh, my panel tonight for this thought provoking conversation on in, uh, the state of uh, security in our country today. Mr. Bulama Bukati, um, and a researcher and expert in security with the Tony Blair Institute in London. Thank you so much for your time tonight. And as well as Group Captain Sodik uh, Shehu, a retired military officer, and our very Professor Usman Shehu, a former Executive Secretary of the NHIS. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for coming. Thank you. And we do hope that our nation will be safer for, uh, for whatever it's worth. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching. I'm Sean Kimali. Bye for now.